in weeks preceding uh, this this event, uh, Nicole and I had a chance to have, have quite a number of discussions with folks about what was going on in rural America in, in, in artificial intelligence. And what we know is while this hasn't been, uh, you know, something that's been uh, kind of go, go, going on throughout the country, particularly in rural, we do know that a lot of the great big healthcare systems and uh, a lot of the urban centers are making a heavy investment in, in artificial intelligence. And uh, the more we heard about the topic, there seems to be just some really huge implications for rural providers and for rural citizens as well. So we, we have an agenda today that includes um, kind of updates from Nicole Clement at, at TASC at the National Rural Health Resource Center. And then Janet Culp is, is here from the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. And they're gonna give you some updates uh, in that regard. Our artificial and artificial intelligence and its re relevance in healthcare, we have Dr. Chandra, Saurabh Chandra from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And uh, Dr. Chandra is, is a national expert on, on this topic. And he's gonna be talking to us about what artificial intelligence is and how it's being used, uh, et cetera. And we also have Brian Scapelli is, is here from Connected Health Initiatives. And he's gonna talk about advancing transparency for artificial intelligence and, and healthcare as well. So that pretty much constitute, constitutes our hour uh, of content. And um, with that, I'm gonna welcome you again. Uh, and then I forgot also Neil Newberger is here as, as he always is. And he's gonna talk about our artificial intelligence and its relevance to healthcare. And then uh, Dr. Chandra is, is gonna speak on the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in rural healthcare. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Nicole. Yeah, not, <clears throat> excuse me, not a lot of updates from me today. Um, just a reminder that um, on the 9th, which is Thursday this week, Task 90 is coming up. Um, we're going to be talking about flex program outcome measures, and then also just a few more really brief updates. Um, sustainable Rural EMS Navigating Change. Uh, that webinar is happening next week, December 14th. And um, I think that's it. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tori and uh, let her tell us about FRC updates. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tori Leach. I'm the FLEX program coordinator. Um, my only real update is to thank all of those who participated in our National Rural Health Day celebration last month. And we had a great number of you participate in the RHI Hub Twitter chat that was focused on telehealth issues. So, and thank you for that. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Jenna Cope, to discuss some Office for the Advancement of Telehealth updates. <laughs> Thank you, Tori. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Jenna Cope with the Office for Advancement of Telehealth. Um, we have a few updates and new resources available, which I will share um, with Tori. I make sure they're in the minutes. Um, first, we do have several new dates. We have February 2nd to 3rd. Um, we have an upcoming Telehealth Resource Center Tech Showcase, if you're interested. Um, we also have April 24th to 26th, 2022. We have the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. They're going to be hosting their annual telehealth summit, and that's going to be at the matrixsummit.org. We also have in 2022, September 26th to 28th, we have an upcoming Northwest Regional TRC or Telehealth Resource Center. Um, they are holding their annual conference. Um, it will be in person in Utah as of right now. Um, there are several new resources if you're looking for telehealth related resources um, available at telehealthresourcecenter.org. Um, there's resources such as the FQHC collection among others. Um, the one other piece that you probably or may have been tracking or seen, um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act 
recently passed, and the bill does contain about $65 billion in broadband. Um, this is something that, depending on your state, your area, you may want to keep an eye out for. There is an anticipation um, based on what's in the bill that there may be about $42.5 billion for states and territories to use for broadband. Um, more information, there is some that is publicly available, some um, requests for comment are available as well, um, but something to keep your eye out for um, in terms of broadband specifically that is coming. Again, I'll make sure um, the links that I have available for resources and information, upcoming events um, are shared to the broader group. And I think that's all I have for today. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jenna or, in, or Tori or Nicole? Okay, we're gonna to move to uh, another item on our agenda. And Neil Newberger from Health Tech Strategies is kind of going to set the stage of what is artificial intelligence and its relevance in healthcare. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Neil. Thank you, Terry and Kim and the, the rest from HRSA. Um, I'm gonna tee this off at a 90,000 foot level before we get to Ryan Scarpelli and Dr. Chandra, who are our real experts in this topic. But before I do, I just want to briefly mention, as I often do, one legislative development that impacts on this coalition. And that is that on November 16th, uh, Representative DeJet and Upton reintroduced introduced the highly anticipated Cures 2.0 Act that would among other things, accelerate medical research, uh, increase patient access to novel therapeutics, and for our purposes, remove current barriers to telehealth services by incorporating what's known as the Telehealth Modernization Act or provisions by Congressman Nunes and a whole host of bipartisan members and kind of take the shackles off, I think, um, uh, in, a, in a big way from the financing perspective telehealth long-term. That bill would also create, a, this. The, the bigger bill would create a, a new agency for research projects uh, for healthcare within the NIH and funded to the tune of about six and a half billion dollars in its first three years. And then uh, very quickly to Jenna Capps's point, I would just add that uh, we will cycle back about these broadband provisions and the 45 or so billion that was made available in the infrastructure legislation. And as we often do, get John Windhausen or some of his colleagues from the Shelby Coalition to take a deeper dive again into its implications for rural health in terms of broadband deployment and things like that. So we're going to hear, as I said, from Brian Scarpelli from the Connected Health Initiative and a lot about his task force and report that they did recently on advancing transparency for AI in the healthcare ecosystem that came out in October. And it has a lot to do with building trust and Brian's gonna talk about that. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. Chandra who's you know down there in the trenches doing this kind of thing. But let me just again, go through a couple of slides. This first one of which you've seen before, which is some of the technology related topics that we have or will be discussing in upcoming months. And we're kind of ticking them off the list and then we'll probably recycle back to them because they're ever changing. That last one is what's today's discussion, AI towards decision support and other applications. Next slide, Nicole. And there are opportunities to use AI and machine learning in remote and inpatient care delivery for enhanced decision support. So in a real world, in, in the real world, they're already doing things like predicting readmits and advance adverse events and detecting changes in patient status and uh, inpatient monitoring and what to do about uh, more effective treatments and managing medications. And to the disease prevention and health promotion world, it's become a big deal for personal care and for public health in terms of not only Rx and vaccine development, and as it relates to uh, sussing out genetic factors and chronic disease factors, but people are starting to in, in, 
to do analyses of social determinants of health, broad, broader uh, epidemiology and disease surveillance, given this and other related uh, public health issues, this pandemic, and personalized care and go anywhere care as a system. I first became interested in it around administrative and administration and finance and happen to know that there are companies like Cotivity and others that are doing, you know, contracting for with 80% of the nation's insurers to do things like claims eligibility and adjudication, including monitoring for waste, fraud, and abuse, and other applications within the institution having to do with clinical documentation, call centers, improving supply chain management. There is a big issue right now for all of us, right? It's being used in healthcare education, teaching and training, and for next generation radiological and other uh, tools of all kinds in biomedical research. Finally, our focus is going to be today a little bit about expanding access to underserved and rural communities. Next slide, please. Okay. And a thing to keep in mind are just jot down these five or six terms. I'm not going to get into them in any detail. AI, artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence, which as Optum notes is not a singular technology, but an umbrella term that uses deep learning, machine learning, and natural language processing, among other methods to perform quote, smart tasks associated with the human mind, such as learning and reasoning. As mentioned, closely associated with that is machine learning, which is able, is, is our technologies that find patterns in unpatterned or unlabeled data. Robotic process automation is the use of software to handle high volume repeatable tasks that previously required humans. We need to pay attention to big data, and I think we had a whole session on big data, privacy and security, and other related issues. And then finally, I would mention software as a medical device, which is, as you know, uh, one of the topics uh, and issues for the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, there's draft guidance in that. Uh, Brian and others may want to comment on that uh, a little later also. Just some terms, thanks. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one, go back two, yep, go back two actually. So here's just a few examples. You can take this. Um, there are many hundreds of more examples augmenting the skills of clinicians, including point of care learning to help retain professionals in rural and underserved areas providing more and better accurate uh, diagnoses in cancer and other illnesses, uh, reducing the cognitive burdens on clinicians, enabling advances in radiology and ultrasound, using neural networks to address signs and symptoms of veterans at risk, some very interesting projects around that going on, adopting natural language processing and voice recognition to improve the EMR user experience towards more accurate health records. How do we make EMRs even that much more complete and accurate? Advances in the development and sometimes patient specific drugs and therapies, providing actionable insights into mass, massive amounts of data around uh, that are being cap captured by wearables, personal monitoring devices, the internet of medical things, connected devices of all kinds giving health insurers powerful analytics tools to, as I mentioned, identify false claims, extending the reach of providers into rural and shortage areas, put positively, improving on actionable data in terms of social, social determinants, as I mentioned, reducing disparities, that is, how do you use what's called positive bias to help reduce disparities, as opposed to some of the untoward things that could happen, which I'll show briefly in the next slide, please. So things that go bump in the night, right? A lot can go wrong here. Can, will, does. To start, there can be a whole host of uh, data quality and data integrity 
issues, garbage in, garbage out kinds of things. And we've talked about that a lot, and most of you know that, right? And even if that data is right, there can be the first thing, a mishmash of data formats, systems, unstructured formats. How do you deal with that? We talked at our very last meeting about privacy and security of data and its importance in rural, in some real world examples in Wisconsin and Minnesota and what folks could and should be doing about all of that. I know Brian, as I mentioned, is gonna talk about data transparency. Can patients, clinicians understand it and can they trust it? And that's the thrust of the work that he's done in the paper he'll describe. The usability of the software, delivering all of this information where and when it's needed. How do we, how to address you know these monumental changes in healthcare that are going to be happening in terms of status quo? And finally, what's often thought of as perhaps maybe the biggest technology challenge that needs to be addressed which is how to deal with what's called algorithmic bias that leads to discrimination and exacerbates inequities in terms of things like age, gender, race, ethnicity, and for our purposes, rurality. How do we not make things worse with these self-directed AI tools that are just off to the races and just make, you know, keep building on all of the the biases that are inherent in some data. Next slide, please. There are a whole host of federal agencies that have and are stepping up to the plate. Um, there is within the Washington, with the White House Office of Science Technology Policy, there's a National Artificial Intelligence Office. The FDA has had a proposed regulatory framework and action plan for modification to AI and machine learning based software as a medical device and are, is doing a lot of work in that area. CMS uh, and uh, National Institutes of Standard and a couple of the agencies have had some small grants, uh, awards and prizes for folks looking at innovative approaches to AI. And, uh, and uh, next slide, please. And then I would just finally mention that the Office of National Coordinator will on January 14th do an artificial intelligence showcase subtitled Seizing the Opportunities and Managing the Risks of Use of AI in Health IT. And I'm thinking that as a follow on to our call today, uh, maybe Nicole and the folks can help get notice of that out to the group because uh, mm -hmm. I think that there's gonna be a high degree of interest in that from, from us given uh, the discussion that's about to follow. And so with that, I will stop and answer questions now or later, but let me turn it over to our close friend and colleague, Brian Scarpelli from uh, the uh, Center for the Connected Health Initiative in the APT Association. Uh, he's often with us on different topics and we're excited to hear about your, your new draft paper, Brian. Why don't you take it away? Thank you. Thanks so much, Neil. And really pleased to be here. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, <clears throat> yes. I think that was a great overview that you just gave too. It's a really exciting time for this for this space. Um, lots going on, lots of different venues, um, developments. So um, I, I'm just uh, again, thank you so much for allowing me to to participate here and share a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit about you know what our what our organization has got going on in this space. And um, I put this out not as a cynical. Uh, request for like membership dues or anything that like that, but a genuine request for in-kind interactions with you all about your experiences, your stories, the, the, the opportunities, but also the, the challenges that you're facing uh, in using auto automation and, and AI or machine learning in, um, in providing, you know, care um, at whatever layer in the process it's helping or maybe not working out so well. I, I, not to go on too much about it, but there is this habit that I think, uh, not to besmirch my own profession too much, but uh, there's a habit that uh, I think uh, folks who run around uh, in, in capital cities like Washington DC fall into where uh, it's easy to become disconnected from uh, uh, you know, the, the people who are actually 
doing these things out in the real world. <laughs> and uh, so it really, really helps just to hear from you all and have any sort of conversation is just pure gold. Uh, we're trying to stay grounded and stay real and, and, and be as useful as possible in, in our efforts. But, uh, you know, I actually do have some, I have some, uh, some brief slides, if it's okay, I can share them. Um, let's see here, how's this gonna work? Is this working? Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Ah, great. Okay, here. I'll just, um, <laughs> when I share my screen, it, uh, it does something weird when I do like a full like uh, slideshow. Uh, so hopefully this works and you all can see this. But uh, anyway, uh, just a little bit about our org. I'm not going to read all these slides, trust me, or believe me, I, I, I won't. Uh, I won't. <laughs> Exposed all that, but uh, just in case uh, it help it helps at all. A little bit of background on our organization and who we are and why we care and, and why we're working on these topics. The Connected Health Initiative is a uh, is a not for profit, uh, you know, basically association uh, pro digital health advocacy group um, that is about six years old. Uh, everything that 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 uh, that this that our that our Connected Health Initiative is doing is basically uh, guided by a steering committee we have, and I will go on and on about who everyone who's on it. It's over twenty five organizations, but um, but the point is that um, I think what what hopefully helps set set our organization maybe apart a little bit is that we've really bent over backwards to populate our steering committee with representation from people throughout the healthcare value chain. So yeah, there's lots, there's private sector interests, startups and some larger companies. There's also not-for-profit academic medical centers and patient groups and um, the physician community itself in the form of the American Medical Association, et cetera. So we're trying to find uh, advocacy um, priorities that have a thread of agreement across all those communities. And there's a lot of them, <laughs> which I'm sure you all are preaching to the choir and saying that, which is nice, right? It's really a unifying area, uh, digital health policy, but um, lots of advocacy across all these different uh, agencies that are relevant, the alphabet soup, uh, uh, as well as, as in Congress and things like that. Um, a lot of the areas that we worked on in the, in the past have been reactive. Government puts out regulation X proposing A, B, and C, and we respond to those proposals. And that's a that's very well and good. But about two and a half years ago, we were, you know, uh, basically decided we want to be as proactive as possible about the role artificial intelligence can play um, <clears throat> in improving. Uh, a caregiver experience and care for the patients and the entire ecosystem when it's deployed responsibly. And, um, uh, you know, and, and some of that was actually a little reactive in us trying to be proactive as much of a contradiction as that sounds, because you may or may not run into this, but, but I, you know, there's like a great example, and this is not me knocking congressional staff, by the way, at all, but uh, is you think about like congressional staff who often are like younger pe younger folks, you know, who um, have uh, diverse portfolios, they're handling banking stuff and housing issues and healthcare for their boss, right? So they have limited time, limited bandwidth. And, um, and you know, time to time, AI would come up in conversations with like those types of uh, that, that community, I guess. And um, more times than not, people would uh, bring up like Skynet, like the the villain from the Terminator movie, like seriously, you know, it's like that's what they think of when they think of AI, or they think of like a Terminator robot, like actually doing surgery, and they're not aware of the the real beneficial deployments today, which you could put under the categorization of of AI that that exist and what is really being worked on and what's valuable and things like that. So we were trying, it was like a messaging thing. We were like, how can we get out in front of that? So initially um, uh, we, we formed this task force and I can share these, these links by the way, if, if uh, ever helpful. These are all just public links. We just put these out there, but we formed these task forces uh, to deal with issues proactively within our governance structure. And that's all I'll say about our governance structure. Otherwise very boring, but <laughs> uh, we formed an a, a AI task force um, and uh, initially, our goal was to come up with some overarching 
health AI policy principles. Um, and these really run the gamut, but it, it was, you know, they, they range from, from payment to quality assurance and pre-market regulatory requirements and other things like that, all the way to workforce and uh, curriculum in education as, you know, the next generation of not just physicians, but, but everyone throughout the, the healthcare, you know, everyone on a, on, a, on, a, on a care team is being trained and new people are entering the workforce, that sort of thing. And then we started thinking about what can we, what threads can we pull on and where is there a need, you know, um, uh, to, to dig a little deeper. So we, we took some of these proposals to different venues. You can see here the World Health Organization was a fun to present at a conference there virtually. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, we also, uh, you know, tried to take the recommendations and kind of pivot and focus them a little bit towards how these tools can benefit Medicaid and CHIP programs uh, as well. That's the next link you see. And then uh, we started having some really great conversations with the folks at the FDA. Um, so I, I think you've, you, as you probably just heard, the Food and Drug Administration has a re relatively new center of excellence for digital health. And uh, it is headed by someone you may be familiar with. He's long been in charge of the digital health policy uh, as a whole at, at the FDA, a fellow named Bakul Patel, very responsive, interactive, and excellent to work with, uh, and a real, uh, really a policy leader uh, there. Um, and uh, he is now in charge of the Center of Excellence. So one of the major priorities for the Center of Excellence, it's consolidating what were some disparate and even conflicting guidance documents and other approaches across FDA between different centers uh, the drug part and the device part, for example, had differing approaches to uh, 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 to so, some so, uh, SAMD or software as a medical device. That's been consolidated now, and they've they're really looking tangibly at at real tangible opportunities they can take through proposing a framework for regulation, op uh, frankly acknowledging where they have authority and where they lack authority. And the FDA has, for by the way. Uh, pretty forthrightly stated that um, they don't that they probably need congressional action to fully regulate the range of AI that they foresee, you know, being beneficial to patients when it enters the market. The difference being locked versus continuously learning algorithms. The latter they don't necessarily have the authority for. So there there may actually be a congressional push for congressional action in the future. That's just interesting to me, right? But uh, <laughs> at least to me it is. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we we heard a long time ago, about two years ago, a year and a half ago, I guess, that um, that they were looking at good machine learning practices uh, as detailed as possible, and and so uh, and so we wanted to try and again be proactive on that. So we uh, worked with some some members within, within this task force. And we came up with a, a pretty detailed set of recommendations uh, for AI that meets the definition of an FDA, you know, of a medical device under the FDNC Act. And, uh, and in that, what we tried to do was go a step further than the draft framework that the FDA has already issued. The FDA's framework they've already issued, again, uh, differentiates between locked and continuously learning algorithms, pr providing some thoughts and, and a framework for locked and, and basically not uh, going there for continuously learning. So we tried to go there <laughs> and offer a risk, uh, a scaled risk management type uh, approach to how continuously learning um, uh, algorithms could be approved and regulated and, and how uh, appropriate market surveillance would occur and things like that. That's what that link is. So next, <laughs> around the same time, we started thinking about what's next. This is all the kind of a story that brings us to these AI transparency principles. But um, we had, um, we, we heard, you know, we, we've, uh, something that I think we've, we've long, we've long recognized and, and I'd be uh, not, uh, I'd be willing to bet everybody here probably agrees is that, um, you know, without buy-in from, the most important constituencies here in the really in this value chain uh, is it as important as a uh, app developer or tech developer is if there's not trust by both the the caregiver and the patient to actually use an AI tool then um, 
then it will probably never succeed. And so, um, and, and a single incident are arguably could destroy that trust, you know, um, in some contexts at least. So, um, so our, 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 we, we thought we'd zero in on that, focus in on that. How can we in, improve transparency and explainability to an extent uh, for patients and caregivers and everybody else more widely? So we held this round table, uh, this public round table, which unfortunately had to be virtual um, in, uh, in April, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, you know, it was a very, it was like an off the record conversation where we we're trying to just put ideas out and or get people to throw ideas out. They might not in a, uh, in a public or on the record setting it was a fruitful, interesting conversation. Then we took some time, took things back to this. Uh, hey Brian, yes. excuse me a minute. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, we oh, okay. really appreciate you doing this. Could you kind of wrap it up in the next couple and then we can make these slides available to our folks as well absolutely we yes i'm sorry i've rambled on too long in the background no, here Terry. Okay. <laughs> appreciate no it yeah and all i have left here is uh some slides uh summarizing some of the findings in the paper so i won't even go on too much about those but i i think the just i can name some themes you know maybe and uh, and then we can certainly distribute these, and people can take a look at this. And 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 we want, by the way, we want these to be living documents. So we'd love if we miss something, we really want to make improvements where we can. This is supposed to be an open and in kind, just kind of collaborative thing with communities like yours. So uh, I think we want to be forthright about there being a shared responsibility for enhancing transparency and explainability, avoiding people pointing fingers at one another and saying, "Well, it's the." It's the developer's fault. No, it's the patient or it's the uh, you know provider's fault and things like that. So we're trying to acknowledge that there are things developers can and should do. Uh, there's um, there's definitely a role for providers and for insurers and payers um, uh, in in being clear and offering resources to patients. Um, the government absolutely has a role. We I, I you know I, I, you may you may uh, find there's some some voices out there who would argue otherwise. I think that's a ridiculous proposal. Um, the the FDA, CMS, the food, the Federal Dr uh, Trade Commission, for example, all have significant and important roles, and it's really like a a partnership style thing. So we so we have uh, uh, recommendations for each of those agencies, and uh, and then we started thinking again, trying to think more widely about other communities, accrediting accrediting and licensing bodies and and boards. You know what role could what role can and should they play, as well as uh, as well as for uh, uh, in, in the educational context. So uh, th this slide is out of date because it claims that I'm really that we're releasing the recommendations in one to two months. We've released them already, so I should delete that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, I I, uh, I would probably just stop there as my contact info. I can send these slides to you, Neil, or or anyone else. Um, uh, I I sorry I've gone on a bit too long. Thanks for the time check there, Terry. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, really appreciate it. And, and again, if there's anything to to kind of put put another you know to put a bookend on 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 what I'm saying here, it's that um, you know. Uh, this task force we have is populated by uh, people who just want to interact in kind and care about this issue. It's really not a pay for play. I'm just be, be frank. It's not you don't have to pay to be on this thing. It's something it's we're trying to really find some consensus across all the different communities that are so important. So if you know you all are interested in just learning more or want to be plugged in or anything like that, any anyone as well or just passively watching the list any any and all of that is is really great and uh uh thanks again thank you brian and we're gonna we're gonna want inter to interact with your group as this unfolds and goes along so thanks again i'll turn it back to to terry thank you okay uh again thanks brian our next speaker is is dr uh Saurabh chandra and he is the new telehealth chief at the center for telehealth at the university of mississippi medical center uh, the University of Mississippi Medical Center is one of two uh, centers of excellence for telehealth. And Dr. Chandra is a tele-ICU physician. He is the former medical director of telehealth for a large health system in New York. And uh, we're really excited to have him here and tell us about really the practical aspects of what is it, what's it, what it's like to actually 
um, use AI for medical purposes. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Chandra. Thank you, Terry. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thanks. Right. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak at this forum. Uh, and just wanted to, uh, you know, state in the, you know, at the outset that I am not a computer scientist. I'm not a, a expert in AI from that perspective, but I bring to you a clinician's perspective of, uh, you know, using AI in the realm of healthcare. And, and as Terry mentioned, I am actually a critical care physician. And prior to my role here at UMMC at the Center for Telehealth, uh, I was the medical director of uh, telehealth at the largest healthcare provider uh, in New York. And um, that is where I was first introduced to the power of uh, uh, AI. And I'll give you the example. So as a tele-ICU physician, I am sitting in a remote center and I have access to data coming from multiple critically ill patients. Uh, everywhere in the different ICUs. We use a vendor platform and we have access to data. Now the vendor has implemented uh, this, uh, uh, this platform in multiple locations throughout the country, which enables the vendor to acquire lots of data on patients. And they can actually lots and lots and lots of data on, on, on patients, thousands and millions of uh, data points. And then they came up with an algorithm that actually they trained like, okay, the input was the data of the respiratory rate or, or, or some other features. And, and the output was, you know, deterioration in uh, respiratory condition requiring intubation on someone developing shock. And, and based on uh, training of the model, and so you have input, you have output, and you have a training of the model, they could then uh, you know, come, come up and do predictions based on characteristics and features of patients, for example, their vital signs, blood pressure, pulse oximetry, things like that, and could actually uh, come and, and, and talk to us clinicians and say, listen, we can predict with a level of certainty which of your patients right now who are not intubated, who are not having a shock, are actually predicted to have uh, you know, respiratory failure requiring intubation in the next 24 hours, or will probably be requiring pressure support for uh, maintaining their blood pressure. And that is, was powerful. I mean, from my practice as a clinician sitting in the tele-ICU, from using data right now that is coming from electronic health records and other data from the bedside, to actually, uh, you know, making clinical decisions, to going a step further and saying, okay, these are now 10 and 20 patients out of my 100 that I'm seeing are actually going to have a adverse event down the road and what can I do for them? That was a game changer as a clinician. That's mind boggling that you're not actually treating something that is happening. I mean, I'm a physician. I treat something that is happening to you right now. If a patient comes and sits in front of me or I'm seeing a patient, I'm treating current condition. And now the, the vendor is telling me you should be treating something that is happening uh, eight hours later. That, is, that was a game changer. That was, uh, uh, as a clinician, you have to think totally differently because when I'm talking to my fellow phys uh, physicians, they would sometimes say, hey, what am I supposed to see if something's happening yet also? So that is where I was exposed to the power of AI. Uh, and, and my interest developed not only in that, in telestroke. So I'm going to actually share my screen and, 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 and quickly go through some of my uh, slides here uh, and see if I can show you my slides. Can you see my slide that shows uh, AI in healthcare? Yeah. Would okay. you mind turning your webcam on too, Dr. Shendra? Absolutely. Thank you. Here is my WebEx. Okay. Oh, got it. 
Okay, anyways. Yeah, great. So anyway, uh, just a brief history. We, I'm at the Center for Telehealth at UMMC. We have our early adopters for telemedicine and uh, for the last 20 years and, and it's been a great journey here. I just joined here last year, but we have a rich history of setting up telemedicine programs all over rural Mississippi, starting with our teleemergency program in the early 2000s. And since 2017, we, we have been fortunate enough to be designated as one of the two nationally known centers of excellence for telehealth, and then allowed us funding uh, from HRSA uh, to develop some innovative programs uh, 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 in, in telehealth. So the objectives are basically to define a little bit about what artificial intelligence is and relevance to healthcare, but talk about, uh, you know, more kind of, uh, uh, you know, day-to-day -day applications that we should be thinking about. And also how, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the applications in, in, in rural healthcare where I, I think it is very pertinent, but basically it's the same thing. I mean, all kinds of healthcare applications can be utilized in rural, rural healthcare, but especially the ones that actually, uh, you know, bridge the gaps in healthcare. And what is the biggest uh, you know, gap in healthcare in, in rural America and rural Mississippi, that's access to healthcare. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a little bit how some of that access to primary care, access to specialty care, and how that can be bridged. But also one of the things that is what I see here, and I'm very passionate about is a chronic disease management. And in, 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 because patients in, 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 you know, for a space like Mississippi, we have one of the lowest rates of primary care physician ratio, primary care physician to the general population. Uh, I think we have somewhere around 104 per 100,000 patients, while the national average is 150 plus per 100,000 patients. And what happens uh, then? Your chronic conditions, diabetes, uh, COPD, uh, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, that you go to a primary care physician, if you don't have access to that, you have more tendency to develop complications. So that's where, uh, remote patient monitoring comes. It's a very signature program of ours here. And I'm going to talk about when I think what I think about AI and what AI can do. But I'm also going to talk about briefly just for a minute as to when you are thinking about AI, you are talking about critical access hospitals, rural hospitals, what you should be thinking about, where are the pain points to, to develop those algorithms that are specific for, uh, for, for rural America. And I'm talking a little bit fast because I have one, uh, you know, eye on on the clock here because uh, 145 already to um, here, and I have a 15 minutes, and I have another meeting to go to. So I'm going to skip through some of the slides, but but make the the uh, hopefully tell you the story behind different applications. So, but basically, let's start with what is AI. Uh, and, and most of these slides, uh, you know, I have uh, put the reference in the, in the, the lower bottom, so I'm acknowledging uh, the, the, the source for some of these material. But what is AI? AI is broadly refers to any human-like behavior displayed by a machine or system. Uh, so basically, you're trying to, to create a computer system, other systems that mimic human behavior. So let's, I would like to explain, like, let's see what, what does the human, uh, you know, what humans do and what is the, the, the corresponding AI domain? So think about what, what do we do? Uh, we communicate with each other via language, speech recognition, ability to read and write, natural language processing, ability to see and process, field of computer vision, ability to understand our environment and move fluidly around that, robotics, ability to see patterns, pattern recognition. So. These are the our features, and that's what they are trying to mimic in um, machine systems and systems, and that's what they call artificial in intelligence. You are trying to mimic human behavior, and the more sophisticated you become, you start picking up, you know, what else we do, the higher functions of reasoning, cognitive function of decision making, so ability to learn from you know, machine learning, you have training data, and we can talk a little bit about that, but executive functions we have, decision-making, that's more sophisticated algorithms like deep learning, neural networks. So 
but wanted to make a point here that what we mean by artificial intelligence is just mimicking our characteristics in in, in machine systems. Uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to. I'm going to skip uh, on this uh, training machine learning slide and talk about applications in healthcare. And this is a a very good book called The Hope, The High uh, uh, Promise and Peril in Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare. And it divides application to in three, uh, three or four domains, patients and families. And I'm going to talk a little bit in deeper details uh, about some of them, but uh, examples are, uh, you know, wearables, smartphones, tablets, apps, and, and you can do health monitoring. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, you know, disease prevention and management for, for diabetes, for obesity, uh, medical management, medical adherence to medication, uh, rehabilitation, stroke rehabilitation, uh, using VR tools, uh, virtual reality tools, uh, medication adherence using nursing assistance. Uh, so there are some, uh, you know, use cases for patients and families, uh, and then use cases for clinician care teams mainly about uh, you know, diagnosis and diagnosis where I talk about like uh, pattern recognition uh, and that's very valuable, for example, in radiology uh, or histopathology, even dermatology, recognizing different patterns, uh, surgical uh, procedures, uh, you know, uh, remote uh, robotic surgeries, uh, precision medicine uh, and, and patient safety, early detection of sepsis. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that as well. And I'll, I'll skip some of these slides uh, on the application for public health program managers and business administrations. And so there are a lot of other applications outside the clinical area for administrative workflows, things like that. I'm going to skip that. Uh, also, I'm going to skip that uh, about the application for researchers and drug discovery and disease prediction for, for this talk. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, when I talk about uh, the ability to read and read and write, now you are talking about uh, you know, natural language processing in healthcare. So natural language processing is a specialized branch of artificial intelligence that enables computers to understand and interpret human speech. Uh, and there are many applications in all the different domains that I talked about. Uh, it's talked about clinical documentation. You can actually have, uh, uh, while we are communicating with a patient, uh, the app can recognize uh, what I'm talking and then actually put it in a text. So a speech to text di dictation and your, while you are uh, having a conversation with the patient, the documentation is already done. How does it benefit patient and physician interaction? I have more time for my interaction with the patient. I have more time to listen to the patient. I'm not worried about how much time I'm going to take after this a visit over, gets over and the time that's going to do for documentation. So that's a very important role there. Computer assistive coding is, okay, they can look up uh, my notes and just figure out from the notes, okay, parse data. Uh, okay, he's talking about respiratory failure with a uh, patient was intubated. He's talking about septic shock has, you know, and then automatically use those for coding purposes and say, okay, these are the IC, ICD codes or diagnosis that, 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 that can be generated and, and automate that uh, reimbursement uh, and coding. So, so a lot of uh, scope there as well. Clinical trial matching is like you can scan millions of physician records and find eligible patients for different kinds of clinical trials and, and, and actually enroll patients by parsing uh, eligible candidates from physician notes in the EHR. Conversational AI, is a chat or chat boss is very actually interesting because this is where uh, you know you can have two way communication. Most of those apps are currently using text, but more and more uh, you can have voice recognition as well. And the field is actually moving towards recognizing not only text based and having chats with 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 patients based on 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 uh, on text and mobile apps, uh, but also now having Virtual assistants having voice recognition, like you, your example of Alexa uh, or Siri, uh, but then also trying to understand your emotion state and recognizing voice and recognizing the emotional patterns beyond that. That's where the field is going. 
and there is role for that in, for example, depression. Uh, uh, patients can 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 actually record. Sorry, the apps uh, can recognize patients who are uh, you know undergoing depression because uh, from the way they are talking and picking up emotions from their voice. But I'm going to just show briefly uh, a study uh, on you know, that, that was used on a conversational text-based thing for weight loss. This was a coaching that was done by mobile app uh, and actually showed that you don't need a physical person to coach uh, the patients. A mobile app text-based co uh, virtual coaching can actually have the same like, comparable weight loss than in-person lifestyle uh, intervention. So, so there is power behind uh, some of these apps as well. Image analysis and AI, uh, this is actually, again, a pattern recognition based on pattern recognition. A lot of FDA approval uh, has been acquired by, by different companies. I'll name a few. Uh, for example, in 2018, FDA cleared a deep learning artificial intelligence-based software to detect and help diagnose wrist fractures in adults. The software interprets bone x-rays for signs of radius fractures and marks the location of the fracture on the image application for rural uh, healthcare. Why you don't, you know, you can diagnose uh, 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 fractures in primary care offices. You can diagnose them in small rural hospital EDs uh, where you don't have, you know, orthopedic uh, specialists or something like that. And you can actually utilize uh, this uh, image analysis software to diagnose these kind of uh, uh, fractures. In 2018, another software company received go-ahead from FDA for uh, software that can identify patients with large vessel uh, occlusion. And we are thinking of employing those that, that company, and I have not named any of the vendors in my talk here today, but what happens? A patient comes with stroke uh, and, and, after two, and large vessel obstruction, which we have large vessels and their obstruction, um, not they just don't benefit only by clot buster drugs, but they need uh, interventional procedure called thrombectomy where a, a wire is inserted and they retract the clot. But most of those, uh, and it's a matter of who is going to walk and who's not going to walk. And uh, so many of these patients don't reach sites that can do thrombectomy on time because Many of them are missed and because you don't have access to experts uh, and again, uh, implication for rural healthcare because we are trying to set up a, a, a you know, if you set up a statewide uh, stroke, then you want to have this kind of software so that some of the patients that are coming in rural EDs, while they are being evaluated by stroke, you go for a CT uh, scan, you go for a CTA, the decision to do uh, uh, that this is a LVO, large vessel obstruction, can be based can be done based on this app, and the patient can be transferred without missing those opportunities, with the, which is a differentiator between who's walking and he's not walking. Another one, very very big one, is a software that can di diagnose complication of diabetes and result in blindness called diabetes retinopathy, and now. You don't need to be in a physician's of, in an ophthalmologist's of office to be diagnosed with diabetic uh, retinopathy. Uh, this can be done uh, by training uh, people on, you know, camera operators, uh, and they can do it outside some of these, uh, you know, ophthalmologist's office. Again, uh, it's a big complication of di diabetes, and again, an, uh, you know, uh, application that can be used in rural healthcare. And there are a lot of other uh, image analysis in the field of pathology, dermatology, uh, and, and dermatology, especially you can, uh, you know, send, send uh, you know, have image analysis and, and, and for treating, you know, for detecting melanoma and, and other cancers. So uh, that's another, so image analysis in AI has a big role, a big role for uh, uh, rural America, precision medicine and AI, just going to, and one, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a minute on that. You can identify and treat individual patients based on their personal attributes and characteristics that are embedded in their genome and in, in their 
how proteins are, what kind of proteins they're making, what a kind of, uh, uh, you know, metabolism they have. So individualized treatments rather than population-based treatments. So for better results, especially for cancer therapy, chemotherapy. Precision medicine and chronic diseases uh, is, is a great thing because a lot of things, social determinants of health, lifestyle, all of those factors play a very important role in the outcome. And if you can follow patients longitudinally, you can know what are their characteristics, how you can then detect early development of complications and prevent hospitalizations and ED. I'm going to spend uh, just a minute on remote patient monitoring, and I'm going to talk about what is remote patient monitoring. Patients are given devices at home, and we do that, glucometer, blood pressure, they have a Bluetooth enabled data. It comes to the tablet through cloud. It comes to our monitoring team here and we have a medical management team. Now let's talk about how AR, AI is going to uh, uh, affect that and, and especially true in rural America. Starting from patient, uh, so patient data is collected. Now uh, when we see there are any aberrations, we call them via phone or send them text messages but my nurses may miss it uh, or may have other patients. But if you ha I have a chatbot, the data goes to the chatbot, chatbot connects to the patient and say, how are you feeling today? Your blood pressure is high or low. Have you taken your medications, not taken your medications? Can you try all of those things? Oh, are you feeling not well? And so they can have all those conversations and then say, okay, uh, can you take another reading? The another team says, okay, it's still high. Then they can connect to the clinical team and say, your patient today is having two episodes of high blood pressure. They have already taken their medication. Should they come to your office? All that can be automated through AI-based chat pass, but then I can stratify patients based on risk, assess, you know, risk assessment and say, hey, this patient needs different level of monitoring uh, as compared to other ones. So a lot of scope of AI in remote patient monitoring, not only in monitor monitoring their values, patient engagement is very high uh, and, and there's role there, but also we have created protocols for different scenarios and you can apply them based on AI and they can come up with clinical decision support. I can take this algorithm uh, and build tools that say, okay, this patient, with this problem, these are the parameters, and this is the protocol, and come up with a clinical decision that, hey, change this medication or add this medication based on the protocols. Get all can be done very efficiently through our AI-based machine learning-based tools. Robotics, uh, there is a lot of scope there. We have all heard of uh, surgeries uh, uh, and, the two types of surgery, surgeries that are assisted and surgeries that are autonomous. We are moving towards autonomous. We are not there yet, but some of them are, are you know, there's a, a, a project, uh, actually a, a app, uh, you know, a robot that was developed in, in, in John Hopkins that can actually suture uh, anastomosis better in, in animals, better than humans can do. So we are moving towards that. Right now it is assisted. We have all heard of Da Vinci, uh, robbers, but we are moving in, in that direction. And then there is virtual reality, AR applications where you, know, you can have stroke rehabilitation, you can have training, and you can have AR and, and ro robotic assisted surgeries. There are a lot of, cons uh, you know, some challenges, and I think uh, in previous talk you heard about it, but I'm going to end my uh, talk here with one thing. What do we need for good AI algorithms? We need data, data, data. And one of the challenges for us is when we talk to and implement programs, EMR integration and EMR, into, uh, you know, kind of getting data from all these smaller rural hospitals and critical care access hospitals. So when you think about um, in, in your role and how, what you're going to educate, what are you going to take home point is that whenever you are implementing a program, think about how you are going to supply the data from small hospitals to wherever it is going. How is that data going to be stored? Who's going to store that data? And how are you going to utilize that data? That is the key take home point because all the algorithms, everything 
is dependent on having more data and access to that data. Uh, and I'm going to end my talk here. And I'm sorry, I don't have uh, time for taking your questions because I have to hop in another call, uh, but feel free to reach out to me uh, and happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Chandra, thank you so much for being here. And if you do have questions uh, for Dr. Chandra, why don't you forward them to us and we in turn will forward them to Dr. Chandra. Just enormous potential here. I'm just really so excited about this. Uh, we, we run out of time, uh, but please uh, complete the, the post polling questions. And again, thank you to all of our participants and our speakers today. And we hope to see you next time.